I tell people the two things you hope never to need is a doctor and a lawyer, but if you need, you need the best you can afford because a bad doctor and a bad lawyer is worse than no doctor and no lawyer. What happens to your business after a divorce? That's what we're going to ask the lawyer today. Hi, I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com, and my guest is uh, New York City divorce attorney Chaim Steinberger. Chaim, thank you for making some time for us today to answer our questions. So it was my pleasure to join you, Rob. So we're talking about in a divorce when there's a business involved. Uh, are there some types of businesses that are, are, are more of an issue or, or might be uh, a little more difficult to deal with through a divorce? Well, businesses are, are often the, the biggest, most valuable asset that the parties have. And of course, this depends on the jurisdiction of, of you listeners of whatever the laws of your jurisdiction are. Right. I'm here in New York City. In New York State, anything you owned before you were married is your separate property. Anything the other, your spouse owned the day before you were married belongs to them is their separate property. So the general rule is that the business is, is not... Uh, marital, if you don't live in a community property state, then it doesn't get intermingled. However, there's a very big caveat to that, and that is the appreciation of separate property can also then be a marital asset ripe for distribution. Does it get more difficult, time if the spouse is involved in the business once they get married and helps to build the business? Does that make things more difficult, or is it still, hey, it was... It was the other spouse's business when they got married is still his or hers. So in a way, so so let me throw some numbers out there because it might be easier to understand. If if the day I married, my business was worth five million, and on the date of divorce, on the date of commencement of the action, the business is still worth five million. Then that five million dollar business is my own separate property. There is no marital component of it that's subject to distribution. If my spouse worked in the business, well, presumably she got the benefit of it as we worked together. I worked in the business, presumably the money I earned during the marriage supported us, supported the family in the marriage. However, if when I got married, the business was worth $5 million, and on the date of commencement of the action, the business is now worth, say, $15 million, that $10 million increase of the value of the business is subject to equitable distribution. Now, the general rule is that in order for the spouse to have a claim on the appreciation of marital assets, number one is it had to be an actively managed asset. It couldn't be passive. So if I had a piece of property that was worth five million, and now at the date of commencement, all the properties went up, and so my property went from five to 15 million, but it wasn't because of anything we did, then my spouse has no claim to that increase in value, and the increase in value is also a separate property asset. However, if I worked in the business, so if I worked in the business, the reason I can dedicate myself and devote so much time, effort, and energy to the business is because my spouse was at home taking care of the children, making me lunches, coming every lunchtime and bringing me a packaged lunch and saying, honey, I'm so glad you're working on the business. And so she can then claim that some of the value of the increase in the business was due to either her direct contributions or her indirect contribution. Indirect contributions was her caring for the other marital aspects of the of our relationship so that I could devote my energies to that. And that gives her a claim to that. And in fact, many spouses um, devote themselves completely. They neglect their families, they neglect their spouses, they, they, they throw themselves into the business. Anything earned during the marriage in New York State belongs to the both of them. Now, just as an aside, because as I'm doing an article for the New York Law Journal on the perils of prenups, the community property in community property states, a judge might be able to go back and even invade separate property assets and bring that in if the non-title spouse would get an unfair result. So it's even more dangerous in community property states. Let's talk about closely held businesses and non-closely. What explain that to me and how that figures in? Okay, so a big business. Let's say I own fifty five hundred shares of General Motors. That's easy. We can go. We could take a look at the the price of the five hundred shares. If I bought it during marriage with marital funds and it's a marital asset. If I if I had it before marriage and presumably if I had five hundred shares of General Motors, I didn't make General Motors go up or down in value. So that's a passive asset that I didn't affect. So if it's a passive asset, it's off the table. It's premarital properties. Let's talk about valuing the business because, you know, one person's 
uh, opinion of how valuable it is might be different than another person's. I would, it would seem to me sometimes it's not so easy just to go, oh, well, now it's worth X number of dollars. Uh, is that something that's difficult to work through often? It is very difficult, and there's an entire science to it. And there are three different methods, and within each method, there are several different approaches. And so when I'm cross-examining an expert on the stand for why the expert reached a certain result of what the business is worth today and what it was worth back at the date of commencement, I have to understand what it was and why the expert picked the, the, the approach and what the method and what they used and what they compared it to, because very often we look at comparables. The general rule under Revenue Ruling 5960 is that to determine fair value, fair value is what a, 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 a an arm's length transaction between a willing buyer and seller, what they would agree the price is. Now, of course, no two things are exactly alike. So if you're selling a property, no, there is no other property at that same exact location. But we might take a look at properties at er, in the neighborhood. But this is a corner property. That's a middle property. So it changes a little bit. So we make an adjustment. So there are lots of um, uh, discretionary adjustments that the, that the evaluator, that the appraiser needs to make. The same thing is true with businesses. So we need to to take comparable businesses, see what they sold for, and take a look at what we believe, take a look at the methods and the approaches. And there's a science, of course, there are lots of books and lots of written on this and lots of experts that, that deal with this. So it's a major undertaking. And, and also it requires the adjustments to normalize. Maybe the owner is taking too low of an income. Maybe they're taking too high of an income. So that needs to be adjusted for so that we get the true value of the business. Also, the owner might have goodwill. People may come to my business because they like me. If we sell the business and I'm not there anymore, what would a buyer pay me for it when I'm not there anymore? So we have to adjust. What would I... What would I have to pay for somebody to be in my shoes and do the work that I'm doing? And then how much does the business owner get? And it's it's the value of the business that the business owner gets. If all I'm doing is I'm I'm earning an income, I'm earning my salary, then I haven't to 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 cite one of my uh, one of my mentors in this area, I haven't built myself a business. I've built myself a job. Mm. Nobody pays money for a job. If I can make the same amount of money working for somebody else as investing in a business, I may as well work for somebody else. So we've got to equalize it. If we pay the business, so if we install somebody to do the work that the business owner is doing, and very often the business owner is doing the job of two or three people, it might be sales, it might be uh, the technicalities, it might be order processing, if we put other people in there, and then will, will the business have a profit? So that's an issue. Mm. Do we discount it for goodwill? That's an issue. Do we discount it for, for tax impacting? Do we look at pre-tax or post-tax? So there are lots of issues in this. It's one of the more complicated areas of, of law. I was just about to say, it sounds very complicated. And another reason why you need a, a qualified, experienced attorney to help guide you through this whole process. I, I tell people the two things you hope never to need is a doctor and a lawyer, but if you need, you need the best you can afford because a bad doctor and a bad lawyer is worse than no doctor and no lawyer. Chaim, thank you so much for your time today and answering our questions. I appreciate it as always. You're very welcome. Thank that's, you, Rob. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been New York City Divorce Attorney Chaim Steinberger. If you want the best information or you're ready to choose a lawyer that lawyers choose, make sure to visit asktheLawyers.com first. Also, please take a second to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Thanks for watching. I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com.